I always appreciate uh, how Kanchan approaches problems, and I really must applaud the way he is managing this uh, ministry also. And one thing is to be able to um, sort of uh, accept certain ideological differences, perhaps may have caused this situation that we are in, and if we are willing to sort of change that position, I think that is a start. So I really do appreciate what he just mentioned also. Um, so one is a political risk. The other one is obviously, uh, you said about the, uh, the currency and, uh, you know, that risk is huge. You look at uh, what has happened to the profitability pre and uh, post uh, currency, uh, you know, uh, depreciation. So who takes that risk, right? So if, if you just, uh, the ownership is public, uh, the funding is uh, cost reflective, uh, you know, delivery and that political risk is taken out. Uh, but uh, the, the other risk uh, also somehow is, uh, you know, given back to the treasury then there is no point in having a, a private uh, participation. That public-private participation may not necessarily work. So there are multiple models. And before we say, look, this is what we are going to do, I think it is worthwhile, Kanchana, to have a much more in-depth uh, in uh, sort of discussion as to, sorry, as to... Um, uh, how we ought to, you know, go through with this. I, I mean, just to end this, you know, when um, I guess, um, uh, uh, you know, the 1961, you know, Mrs. Bandarna uh, nationalized, I think, 83 or so petrol stations, uh, Shell, Caltex, and SO, and created previously though in 1961 then petroleum corporation um you know that at the time was a political ideology i mean nm perra colvin r peter kenneman they all thought this is the way to go right uh, but that ended up with this gigantic loss making monster uh, whereas uh, those people who were in sri lanka at the time uh, did many other things in many other countries and made those countries, uh, you know, much more developed than we are. So, going back to that same model, I recall you saying this because we were desperately looking for dollars. And I, I made a comment, I recall, Kanchana's thinking is right, but, uh, you know, just to get over this six months uh, situation, if we go back to that 1961 model, uh, who is going to assume the risk? If they are not willing to assume the risk, then what is really the, the actual sharing? What is the public partnership, a public-private partnership? It has to be a partnership. So those are my sort of opening remarks. Perhaps we can have a much more, much more uh, uh, lengthier conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Andres, uh, for your opening remarks, please. Yeah. <clears throat> From my side, I must say I am really very positively um, impressed that we are having today such an open discussion on privatization and public-private partnership. I think, Minister, you are, you are playing the key role in the discussion. And when we were starting to prepare the report in the beginning of June 2022, I could have never imagined that we would talk like this. You said there is no area of CPC that is not open now for public-private partnership and uh, for privatization. I think that's a new development and um, I appreciate that very much. All the policy recommendations that we have mentioned in the report have been taken up by you and I think that's a really very positive development. Now having said that, I think it's very important that we will have a dialogue. A dialogue not only between politicians and business but also between the trade unions and the civil society. A transparent, open dialogue. And I think it's very important that we will have an accompanying legislation that protects the rights of potential investors. We have currently, when we are talking about fair competition and antitrust legislation here, the 
Consumer Affairs Authority Act, which is a quite basic act, which not really detailed, uh, regulates in a detailed way antitrust and mono monopolies. I think that's a very important thing to protect the interests also of potential investors and to encourage really sustainable long-term investments. And Dr. Harsha De Silva mentioned also the currency risk. I think it's also very important to discuss openly again in the, the, the government uh, the instruments of covering currency risk, the instrument of hedging. There's a negative experience uh, at CPC in the past, we all know that, but I think we should not forget about that. The currency losses that you have incurred during the last years were tremendous. The, the, the major contributor of, of losses are the financial costs, you know that, and uh, the currency losses. And I think to cover this risk, that's a very important thing. Then also, I think it would be very important to discuss openly uh, the debt restructuring of, uh, of CPC. You know, there's, there are the high debts with regards to Sri Lankan Airlines, with regards uh, to CEB, with regards to Sri Lankan Railways and to Sri Lankan Army. And I think if we don't talk openly about that and find a way also to restructure the debt, CPC would never be able to be positive and profitable again. And, um, and that's, I think, a very sensitive topic. We all know that, you know, because CEB is so important for the industrial development here of the country and, of course, uh, the same also for Sri Lankan Airlines. But I think we should find a way or you should find a way really to mitigate this risk and to increase uh, liquidity at the level of, uh, of CPC. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for those uh, opening comments. And, and, and thank you for laying the foundation for a great discussion, uh, also for being so candid. Uh, uh, okay, so why not? Why, why not go to the uh, floor for questions? Um, uh, uh, Raghu or Samantha, do we have a mic we can get across? Okay. Uh, while we get a mic there, uh, Mr. Minister, today was a, a big news day um, uh, for uh, surrounding Sri Lanka's economic crisis. Uh, there is the announcement of uh, extended fund facility uh, potential uh, for Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, around this agreement with the IMF, are there any uh, prior commitments or undertakings uh, that relate back to the CPC uh, with the current discussions with the IMF that, you, that we've had? No, there is no uh, prior commitments uh, with the IMF. Uh, actually, some of the things that we did uh, were basically uh, that was needed to be done. Uh, I know that IMF uh, would have wanted to see these as well if it was not implemented. Uh, but I think we took the initiative, uh, did most of these back in, started doing back in April, uh, and implemented most of this work by May. Uh, because we do understand even if um, IMF is not going to be a complete solution for our economic crisis, we do have to find our own solutions as well. Uh, so, uh, we knew that we had to work uh, somehow, if, even if the IMF was getting delayed, the other development agencies' funding would be delayed, we'll have to find a, a solution uh, for ourselves as well. So, some of the work that we did uh, were uh, based on guidelines given by the Ministry of Finance, uh, but some of them were uh, actually discussed in the Cabinet as well, that changes that needed to be done. All right, uh, Professor Samarajiva. Uh, the question is uh, regarding competition, which is a point that uh, Dr. Hergen uh, uh, brought up. Um, one of the instruments uh, when we look at competition in an infrastructure industry is we are looking at any choke points, any possible areas where market power could be, could be exerted. And I believe uh, I was looking for a mention of the Ceylon Petroleum uh, Terminals, uh, Storage Terminals Company which was created to handle that. Actually, the intention, I think, was to have all three players. We were looking at uh, Sipetco, uh, Lanka IOC, and Sinopec back in 2003, uh, that they would jointly own that entity. So what is the state of that is a general question, I suppose. And then you referred to the lack of competition provisions, but we do have very strong competition provisions in the Public Utility Commission law. 
uh, including you, know, you can do dawn raids and the whole works, uh, big fines, etc. And generally speaking, petroleum companies are subject to that kind of, uh, well, they have a tendency to engage in collusion. So that's why that language is there. And my question to the minister is, is there any, any um, consideration of putting the petroleum industry under the authority of the Public Utilities Commission? Because uh, the provisions for effective regulation are there uh, if it is privately owned. Uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, PUC is very good at regulating state entities. And I think it's quite ineffective with regard to CEB. But that's another story. You want to start, Minister? Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of CPSTL, I think uh, LIOC currently does have a stake at CPSTL as well. Uh, there are more members from CPC and C uh, LIOC both that uh, uh, do the managerial work at CPSTL. Of course, uh, if there are new private partners coming in, uh, that would be an option that we'll have to look at. Uh, CPSTL uh, owns the pipelines, the storage tanks, uh, the distribution channels. So, of course, there should be a partnership with the other private stakeholders coming in. Uh, initially, what we discussed was CPSTL to carry on doing a service, uh, the distribution as a service fee uh, from those private companies. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, we'll have to look at how we are going to regulate them. Uh, when there are private uh, stakeholders coming in, uh, public-private entities, how it is going to be regulated. That is also something that we are discussing. I don't know whether it's going to be PUCSL or if it is going to be regulated by something else. Uh, but of course, regulations are going to be uh, important uh, when these private uh, suppliers, private companies come in. You want to add anything? Yeah. Fully agree on that, and um, but <clears throat> you are talking about the case that CPC would be still in the market. But if we would have an area which we fully privatized and we would count on private foreign direct investments, I think then we would be again at the CAA Act. And um, if you see the Act, I don't know if that is possible yet. Public Utilities Commission, if that is a possibility. Hmm? I mean, if I, if, if I may add something to it, I mean, I think when the UCSL was originally thought of, petroleum was part of it, that downstream petroleum distribution is supposed to be regulated by the PUCSL. So, the, like Rohan just mentioned, those provisions already do exist. So, it's just, uh, uh, you know, bringing the, the new players in and telling Damita here, Look, this belongs to, this is part of your scope. Um, unless he wants to add. Unless you want to say something, that better. Yeah. Yeah, actually, under the PUCSL uh, Act, uh, petroleum is one of the subjects to be regulated. And of course, that act has been written to regulate the pri mostly the private uh, participation. So the competition laws in, I think, Section 29 downwards is very strong, stronger than CEA's uh, provisions. And this anti-competition uh, competition laws are very important here if you have three or four players, especially private players, to safeguard the consumer. So I think in the PUCSL Act uh, has the strongest anti-competition uh, laws as far as I know. Uh, Minister, I'm wondering, now that you've called for EOIs and they are likely to have several more players in uh, downstream petroleum, uh, how will pricing then work? Will it work on a formula or do you think you can let the market determine prices? Uh, I mean, that, that happens in many markets where the, there are enough players so that you know, the market's fairly efficient and can determine prices. What's your thinking currently? Of course, the, the, the formula will be a base to... Uh, calculate the pricing. Uh, but of course, we'll have to regulate as well. Uh, I think a competition is a healthy competition. So I, I think with a, uh, multiple suppliers coming in, uh, I don't think anyone would want to... Um, once we introduce a formula and base it on that, and maybe allow the suppliers also to... Uh, 
work with the regulatory uh, arm to decide on the pricing, that should not be a problem. So that's what we are we are thinking right now is that. I mean, one is just supplying the fuel, right? And if you the quality, of, you know, whatever the QS stat, the quality is met, then it's all right. But then, what about the service? I mean, the competition can come in other services, right? So even pre-nationalization, they colluded. They all had the same pricing, but. Um, Maybe Caltex was better in having two people come and clean your windshield as opposed to SO having only one person coming and cleaning your windshield those days. I mean, so the, the competition can be created in other ways than just the supply of your basic product. The basic product itself can have variations. Um, so it can be brought in, in my view. Uh, so, so essentially some uh, players may choose to compete on price, others on value addition. Uh, but it, it then what, what would be the role, I mean, I don't know whether you have an official position on this, but what would then be the role of a formula? Do, do we need a formula or do you, can, can you let the market determine? Is, is, will we have enough players and can we then allow the market to determine the price? Right now, what we do with LIOC and CPC, we do have a formula, so we base on that. But LIOC and CPC have different pricing mechanisms. Uh, so there is a committee that decides on what's the better option to go with. So they both have their own ways of uh, calculating uh, their pricing. But what we have done is, uh, now if you look at September 1st, when we did the evaluation today, um, LIOC with the uh, import pricing much lower than CPC currently uh, has a larger uh, portion of profits than the CPC. But we do base it on uh, the, the formula and the committee decides on what sort of pricing that should be adopted on that week. So that's what we are trying to base it on. I mean, if you have a highly inefficient operator and a very efficient operator, obviously they would, you know, <laughs> want to, you know, maximize their profits, right? So if the formula is going to give LIOC, you know, huge profits, then, you know, why would they want to upset that apple cart? Okay, I'll uh, throw this back to the floor. Uh, yes, uh, there is, uh, shall we go to the bottom, uh, back of the room and then we'll come to you. Over there, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, the mic's here, so we'll start here. And we'll come to you, Shiha, then. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Shiham Marikka from the National Chamber of Exporters. Uh, Loss-making state enterprise, this is a hot topic these days, the media and everywhere, and CPC is right on the top. Now, even in this book, I noticed there is a separate area and a page talking about the underperforming or related to the underperforming overpaid workers and their benefits. I think uh, while, we are, while we have 10 contributors here, if you look at the social media and the media, it's focusing on the people there. I feel sometimes, you know, here we are talking about people. It can reach to their families. I remember one time there was a social media article saying the guy who comes to give the electricity bill, <clears throat> he is being paid an incentive for reporting correctly. Later, of course, it was justified and by that time the damage was done. Now, people will start looking at anybody from the CPC saying that this guy is not doing anything. He's earning our money. He's the one who is destroyed. You know, this kind of perception can come. But here we are talking about 10 contributors. So my question is, what kind of a percentage do you think the underperforming uh, staff contribute to their total losses? And why don't we uh, highlight little more the other nine or uh, the other 10 uh, contributing factors instead of focusing on this particular thing only because this relates to people here. This is my view and this question is on the percentage. And Honorable Minister, I, since I represent the exporters, we would like to thank you for the initiatives that you have taken and we feel positive, especially on that hard stance you take. After you make a decision, you follow it through. So, uh, wish you all the best in that. And uh, those are my concerns. Thank you. I wonder how many of you have seen the minister's tweet several days ago. Uh, 
gained a lot of traction. I, I think you said there's 4,200 employees in CPC and CPC, uh, the terminal company, and you can count with 500. Uh, yeah. Broader question uh, from Shyam. Uh, just, to, uh, yeah. just to add to that, now, uh, when we talk about I mean, too many staff members, we can also ask who brought them there. We can point the finger right to the top. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think we have highlighted uh, multiple reasons why we are in this mess. Not just the allowances paid or the highly paid workers, but unfortunately that's something that the media picks up or the social media picks up on. I've highlighted several reasons why we are in this mess. Exchange rates. Um, when we purchased uh, 180 days ago petroleum products for 203 rupees a dollar, uh, when we are paying them back now, we've already paid some money with the two state banks, but unfortunately we have to pay 368 rupees on the dollar when we are paying them back. So that is one of the biggest reasons for our, uh, losses that we've made. And also there are other multiple reasons because uh, before the full pricing formula was introduced, I, I don't want to put this entire blame on the workforce uh, because I know that um, different administrations took this continuous decision on not putting out a full pricing uh, based on the cost. Uh, so kerosene has always been sold in the market uh, for uh, less than uh, what it had cost the, uh, the CPC. That was a massive uh, burden. Uh, and also one of the biggest things is uh, highly paid workers. I, I don't mind people being paid the right salaries, even if they're paid higher salaries, if they do the job they're assigned to do. One of the biggest burdens in CPC is inefficiency. Uh, if they're not, most of them, I wouldn't say everyone, most of them don't perform their jobs that they should be performing. I'll, I'll take an example from LIOC. I visited LIOC. Uh, there's about 159 people working at LIOC, which operates 254 outlets, uh, 1,200 outlets operated by CPC and CPSTL is 4,200 strong workforce. Uh, and when I spoke to LIOC officials there, what they said was they're looking after maybe 50 to 60 outlets. Uh, whereas CPC, maybe 60 people are looking at one outlet. So that's the difference. Uh, and I know that uh, continuous multiple governments, multiple ministers who have been in power uh, in this position have, have added to this. Uh, that's where we need to change. And one of the main areas that we need to do change is also the, the managerial director post. It should be someone who's experienced in this sector, not a political appointment. One of the uh, uh, one, one of the things that I want to change as well so that he is there for a, uh, maybe a six to eight year period so that he can actually contribute to uh, a better management that he does the administration work. So I, I do agree that people do target the workforce, uh, but of course there are some workforce that are to be blamed as well, but, uh, but of course there needs to be restructuring on that. I must really say I find that incredibly courageous that you are talking like that. Um, Shyam, you are right, that's not a major loss contributor, but I think uh, to introduce key performance indicators, uh, performance-based remuneration system, that's a, that's a must. Also that you talk about the management level, of course, that has been in the past really a big concern. No? We had nominations for six months, people that were not related at all to the industry and didn't have the experience. If we are talking now about long-term perspectives, long-term strategies, and we are looking also for long-term partners, then we need such a system. And I think it's very important. Maybe you are right, it's not a major loss contributor, but it's extremely development for the future of the CPC. Yeah? I think one of the main reasons why people are targeting is the collective agreement. Uh, the 25% salary increment every th three years, uh, not based on performance. That is one of the biggest things that the public has got uh, aware of right now. CEB, CPC, Telecom, Ports Authority, all of them have a collective agreement. And some, some institutes also do uh, have uh, pension schemes uh, and also uh, taxes being paid by the same institute. 
So pay tax being paid by the same institute. I think central bank is also the same. Uh, CP, uh, CEB did it for a long time. So those are certain things that the people have picked up, public have picked up on. Uh, can I go to Sh Shiha and then come to you, Murthy Sah? Yeah. Right. Uh, Minister, now uh, you are handling one of the uh, worst loss-making uh, institution, CPC, after the Sri Lankan Airlines. Uh, have you thought of any uh, 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 plans to recover the losses? Like, uh, there, there is a perception that it should be included in the formula. And, uh, you know, every liter, one or two rupees. So what's, what's, what's going forward on uh, the re loss recovery? That's what we are doing right now. And uh, unfortunately, you're questioning why we are making, keeping profits as well. So I see some media uh, statements when we, we do have to recover some of the uh, losses. So that's one of the guidelines given to us by the uh, finance ministry and the central bank as well, because uh, the monetary board was very strict on uh, what sort of allocations should be done from the banking sector and uh, what sort of involvement the central bank should have. And we should actually be thankful to the central bank. It's not their duty to uh, provide dollars for petroleum importation, but they have gone out of their way. The last three months, we've depended on central bank funds to uh, import all the petroleum products. And they've actually, we had a meeting with the monetary board. Um, they actually did suggest that we do recover some of the uh, past losses as well. So that's why we are not keeping at just at par level. Uh, there are some profits now. Uh, if you had seen what I shared today, uh, I think uh, a, a litre of petrol for CPC right now, we are actually uh, a profit about 50 rupees, basically about 45 to 50 rupees profit on a litre uh, and uh, other products as well. Uh, 50 rupees after paying the taxes also? After paying taxes okay. also, right. Yeah. You need tax income as well. I know that people have questioned uh, we should take out the tax component. Uh, I, I don't think it should be taken out because not everyone does use fuel. So people who do use fuel should be paying that tax, uh, not putting that tax entirely on the entire uh, population. Murtisa, please. Uh, have you a mic uh, here, please? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have a few observations. So, Shamindra, you'll have to bear with me. I'll speak quickly. Uh, first thing is that this says public-private partnership, and I was briefly glancing through the report that had been written. Uh, there was a mention of pipelines. And pipelines ideally can do be done through public-private partnership. And where the public comes in is the land rights to run the pipeline through. So, uh, Previously, when I had engaged with the people who built the highways, etc. in Sri Lanka, I had asked them, did you keep any allocation for pipelines and public conduits and ducts? Uh, so, Minister, I would say that uh, it's significantly cheaper to transport uh, fuel uh, through a pipeline than um, taking it across Bowser's. So, this is an easy win uh, to allow private operators to go and invest and build a pipeline. Of course, it has to be regulated. In fact, Warren Buffett loves pipeline companies because it's a very captive market. The second comment I want to make is that I disagree with the authors of the report of their comment about hedging. Uh, my day job is in finance. And uh, I think hedging is a good idea for firms who have a contracted selling price and therefore they have to hedge their buying price. But if you're selling in the spot market, you can buy in the spot market and it's a bad idea for an entire country to try to hedge you know businesses can hedge because prices go up because it's reflecting the scarcity value of a resource and this is a hundred percent imported product so those are two observations uh, then i have a few questions i'll repeat the question shamindra you can follow up with the panelists the first thing is minister i read in the newspapers about the expression of interest for retailing I think I had previously engaged with you. One of your conditionalities is that any potential new player has to be able to provide fuel on credit. 
I have reservations about that because our country has an imbalance, external imbalance. That is why we are going through a balance of payment crisis, etc. You know, credit is then going to contribute to that imbalance. We have to correct the imbalance. And if you put that as a conditionality, retailing of fuel is a different business to providing credit. So I would suggest that that be rethought of because you may not get the best retailing players in the world to then come because you are restricting the, the best players because they have to come with credit. And if we have a balance of payment problem, we have to tackle it in a different way than unbundling the petroleum sector. Uh, so maybe when I finish, you can give your thoughts on that. Uh, the next thing is, uh, because I have been looking at this industry for the last 17 years after IOC listed itself in 2005. I've never figured out why we price diesel, petrol, super diesel, super petrol, octane, night, all these in different, different prices. because affordability of who uses it. I mean, that should be handled through the tax system, etc. in a different way. But it's technology dependent. I mean, it's bizarre because I used to write this report on vehicle registrations and I have written many times about the crazy way we tax diesel vehicles versus petrol vehicles because we sell diesel at a price. Now that you're doing many of these progressive things, why don't you rethink about how we price diesel? Because diesel is not the poor man's fuel. It's a complete myth. In most European countries, and Andreas can correct me, I think in Germany, the price of diesel is higher than the price of petrol because it's considered to be more pollutive and it has different dynamics. And today, the diesel price in the world market is at a significant premium to petrol. As you know, the crack spreads are very high. So why don't we make that pricing also cost-reflective and have like a common tax? Of course, if you have corrective taxes, the corrective taxes for petrol are higher because of all the accidents and etc. Uh, so that was my second question to you. What your thoughts is that should we have this kind of differentiated pricing or should we make it more technology neutral? So it doesn't matter whether it's a petrol engine or diesel engine. Uh, and finally, to both uh, Harsha and yourself, the fact that, you know, what you're saying that you're going to have uh, a more transparent formula, uh, should it be more short term? Like in India, it's a daily change. And there is no one price for the whole country. It's cost reflective. So if you have to buy petrol in New Aurelia, it costs you much more to transport it to New Aurelia. Colombo price should be different. Now, why do you think for the last 30, 40 years, petroleum is so political? Because the World Bank has shown that 70% um, of the consumption is by the top 30% of households. And this is a completely imported product. This is not something that we eat, etc. But every election, the politicians are meddling with fuel prices. And the minister is very forthright saying that we did something wrong, this thing. But philosophically, can you explain to me why it is so political? I cannot rationalize. Do you want to start tackling that? Uh, perhaps the first one, uh, can I ask the minister to tackle the first one? Because it's about the EOI and, uh, and, and your condition for credit. Yeah. Uh, of course, on the Pipelines, uh, I do agree with you. We need to work on public-private partnerships on the pipelines. And uh, I don't think many countries do have uh, fuel trucks uh, distributing fuel right in the middle of the day. Uh, so many trucks that you see passing by. That's a massive cost to CPC as well. Right now, we pay more than 550 million rupees monthly uh, for the distribution of uh, petroleum products. So that's a massive burden on uh, CPC. I do agree we need to go to pipelines and one of the reasons why we did invite uh, new suppliers to come in uh, and you asked about credit. Credit is not for the government. Uh, what we did imply was that um, when we discussed with Central Bank, uh, the Finance Ministry, the Monetary Board on our short-term requirements, uh, one of the things was that they were not able to allocate uh, the exact amount of money required uh, for petroleum imports. 600 million is roughly what we need for power generation and our domestic fuel requirements. But uh, what we thought was initially getting in a few new suppliers is that they use their own credit lines to import their own fuel uh, and they invest whatever money that they recover in rupees 
uh, on infrastructure development, the pipelines, storage tanks, that's some investment that they need to bring. So this would be an investment that they would be bringing in terms of petroleum products here and whatever sales that they have, they can invest in uh, infrastructure development and then they can take it back later on. So that was the initial thought behind that. I know that there are limitations when we do apply that for large companies to come in, but we do have our short-term requirements as well as the long-term requirements. So we needed to address both at the same time. Uh, second uh, matter, I think, uh, was about the, uh, the pricing um, of petrol different products. I do agree with you. Uh, I think uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka are the only two countries in the region that still uses 92 petrol and auto diesel. We do still keep using it because our refinery is outdated. Our refinery only produces 92 and auto diesel, kerosene, uh, HFO, naphtha, uh, and there are not many new refineries that do produce 500 ppm diesel and 92 petrol. Uh, so we do have a disadvantage in that, and we are trying to upgrade our existing refinery. We are looking at that. And also we need to go away from 92 petrol and Lanka auto, di uh, auto diesel uh, and go into much premium products, maybe European three products, other products that are required but right my, now. My question was, the I don't pricing. know what, what the price, but I think uh, 95 was 550 rupees and 92 was 450. So it's the taxation. No, no, that, that, that right now is because the LAD is mostly used for public transportation. So we, can't, we cannot keep super diesel and auto diesel at the same pricing levels. Uh, it's mainly used for uh, CTB depots, buses. Uh, the fisheries industry has a massive requirement daily. If you look at the 4,000 metric ton daily distribution that we do, only 1,800 goes into the fuel stations. 700 metric tons to... 1,000 uh, metric tons goes into public transportation. Another 300 goes into the fishery harbors, the 22 harbors. And the majority goes into the industries, the export industries and the domestic industries because they require diesel for their generators, for their machinery, their operating uh, operations as well. So the majority of uh, auto diesel goes into that. Uh, super diesel is for vehicle use. That's why we have kept it at two different price levels. Petrol, the same way, we have kept it most of the petrol are for public transportation for uh, tri shores and other taxis. So we, can't, we cannot keep it on two different levels. I, I know what you're implying, uh, but we do have to keep it at two pricing levels uh, to keep the public uh, transport and the other sectors going as well. Um, uh, Harsha, can I just ask one follow up and then I'll come to you? Uh, uh, on the matter of the EOI uh, minister, you mentioned uh, your thinking, your rationale being uh, uh, you would want them to uh, finance the imports on credit uh, and uh, whatever sales they make in Sri Lanka, you would want them to invest it, right? Is, 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 are they expected, are players expected to bid on that basis with timeframes they allocate or is this short term that you are referring to defined, will, be, will it be defined in when you get to uh, beyond the EOI round uh, into bidding? Yeah, we, we, we will do that uh, when we do evaluate and when we do get into the RFP stages, we will do have discussions and we've had this pre-bid meetings, we've uh, discussed with them what our requirements were. Uh, so most of the uh, there was about 60 companies who were participating at the pre-bid meetings, but the, the number of companies that actually bid was 24 companies. So they all do understand the requirements because we do need to, in the short term, fulfill the requirements that we do have. We can't wait for six to eight months or maybe a year until our economic situation is better to get whatever full requirements, 100% of the full requirements that we have. So to do, do that immediately, in the next couple of months, this was one way and to get players to be there for a longer term as well. I have several um, areas where I disagree also. On the first one, Murtasa, I mean, it's absolutely, that's what a private-public partnership is about. You know, I mean, where is the risk going to be shared and your example on pipelines. Um, and um, so, so I think, when we talk about this, we need to look at the entire industry. It's not just the retailing of fuel in a, at a pump, but all the others. And there may be, uh, you know, greater opportunities in outside of just 
you know, pumping at a gas station in other areas where infrastructure needs to be developed. I mean, why would LIOC transport uh, fuel in these big browsers from Trincomalee uh, to Karambo and to wherever else? It just does not make sense. Uh, okay, right. So, so, so th that's that. I think we need to look into, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of things that we can do. Uh, you know, opportunities for public-private partnership is there. On your second point on on hedging. Um, uh, you know, I don't think the Petroleum Corporation has a treasury. Does it, Mr. Chairman? Uh, we do have a treasury. When was that set up? Uh, it was set up from, uh, I think, uh, before we, we, I have come there, but uh, only three people. Uh, yeah, I mean, how know, can, I mean, we, that, that's, that's, I think, uh, you know, First, you need to have a treasury, you know. No, I, we had a discussion with uh, Lanka Clear chairman, and he will have a consultation with us and we'll try to... Uh, no, no I mean, you will have to run a world-class treasury there. I mean, you're looking at, what, four, five billion dollars of uh, transactions. And how can you run a, such an important operation without a treasury? Um, so I think fundamentally, before we talk about the various different instruments that we are going to use, a treasury has to be established and competent people must be uh, employed to run that treasury. So that's my point on that. And then we can perhaps look at what the different instruments are, whether, you know, a hedge is right or wrong uh, and so on. Because like the presenter said, is a kind of, it became a, like a dirty word after what happened with Mr. Cabral. Uh, the third point was... Um, you know, about the credit. And I completely uh, agree that these need to be dichotomized. I mean, a man who is able to provide credit and a man who is able to uh, provide uh, services to, you know, uh, you know f distribute fuel are two different men or women, companies. So why putting these together, you're actually not getting the most efficient outcome in my view. Now, for instance, even in this much talked about coal uh, procurement, uh, only one company bid. And that is also because there was a condition on credit, right? I mean, who is better able to, uh, you know, get a, a good deal on credit? Would it be some fuel distributor somewhere or would it be some other player? who is able to find the best deal in, in, in financing, right? I mean, so I do not believe that you should put these two together. I believe you need to break it up so that you get the best in both. These are things that we can discuss. And I think you're getting a little um, sort of, uh, sort of carried away, if I may use that word, not in a bad way, Kanchana, because we had a problem. You know, you, you said it when we actually didn't have any money. But that's, that's a short-term thing. We will resolve this, right? I mean, that we, we, we will all work, uh, government, opposition, everyone, as a country, as a nation, private sector, to get this country out of this rut. We will get it out. And that, if, if the next 30 years is going to be based on something that happened for three weeks, I don't think that is the right solution, right? So, uh, uh, whether, uh, in my view, break these two things, you know, don't put these two together, you may not end up with the best solution. On the fourth one about the pricing, right, why these diesel prices are different than petrol prices, I don't know about it, so I won't. I won't answer, but the, your last one about whether it can be done more regularly on a daily basis or something like that. I don't know. India does it, but, but the point is we have to do it. Whether we do it daily or whether we do it monthly, we have to do it. You see, when one government starts it, the next government stops it. That, that, you have to have continuity and people have to start believing in, in this, you know, thing 
working. So these are political uh, interferences that come, and that is the kind of risk that we need to mitigate, right? I mean, somebody gets into a long-term agreement, and suddenly you're not going to be getting uh, the market price of fuel. You're completely messed up, right? not because of what you did, because of somebody else did. And I my ask you that most important question, Harsha. I mean, you may answer. Why is fuel politicized? Can no, you explain to me for the last 50 years? Yeah, which yeah is I mean, Murtasa, you're a very smart guy. I mean, you need to understand from a politician's point of view, right? right what, what, what Kanchana is saying is it's public transport. You know, like you, you, you have to try and make, uh, you, know, you know, at least a perception that the government is trying to give a bus ticket at an uh, affordable price. Right? So if you look at fuel, 70% of fuel, I think, is for transportation. Only about 20% goes in for uh, power generation. And 20%, uh, I think, for aviation fuel or something like that. So, so one, I think, is definitely, you know, to affordable transportation. Uh, and the other, I think, is, you see, uh, you know, retail pricing, you know, and which is connected. You know, everything goes up in price. When 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 uh, you know fuel prices are increased, so those are my comments. And I I really can't I I think this is a really good uh, forum, and these questions are coming up. Uh, and if we are going to take a thirty-year decision, right, whether it should be based on that experience of three weeks, or whether should rethink that uh, and look at it afresh. Andres? I think that question why fuel is politicized is, is a very good one. No? Because if we look now in, to the European market, for example, to Germany, we see that fuel prices are determined by the market. Um, the, the entire refining industry is private. So the, the government has, does not have any stakes on that. Uh, the pipelines are private. Everything, the transportation is private. So I think... Um, that's um, it's a different system. I th you are breaking up now this monopoly. You are open uh, the the market, um, but I think it's really worth uh, to think about it. Why fuel here in Sri Lanka is so politicized? Politicized. You said, of course, you think about the consumer and uh, that the government should regulate the price somehow. I think that instrument will be still always there. No, you have can regulate it through taxes indirectly, or also re regards to the environmental impact or other. Uh, um, factors that you consider important for your policy. But I think it's really worth thinking about it um, to maybe open up uh, completely or step by step um, in the interest of the consumer, but also in the interest of uh, reducing government costs and uh, mitigating risks. I mean, if I may add one. Yes, go ahead. It is, I mean, we got to look at this whole subsidy Think completely differently, right? I mean, market pricing and targeted subsidies. So, I mean, not everybody should be given a diesel at the same price. I mean, market price, and some people should be giving a, given a bigger subsidy than the others. So, that's a whole new discussion, I think, that applies to more than fuel. Uh, okay, just this one. Come to you. I'm looking at the report. Um, I come from the maritime sector. The maritime sector, I would always look at models of success in other countries. I mean, this uh, fuel industry, are we, the, are we the only unique guy here around the world of 190 countries? Or are there any case studies where people have come out of this situation from monopolies and brought in a successful model in any other country? Because I see the number of PPP models available, but if you look at the number of in countries in the maritime sector, I would say look at the maritime port authority of Singapore. Then you know how they do it. Is there anything like that uh, we are looking? At? That's a broad question. If uh, anybody in the panel wants to comment on it, uh, but great idea. Uh, can I come to you, uh, Doctor Perer? Uh, Ragu over there uh, at the table at the back. Just to pick up on some uh, comments that were made, one is regarding uh, the personnel and, and the salaries. 
Uh, I think we need to realize that CPC is probably one of the highest uh, revenue generators, or has the, one of the highest turnovers in the country, public or private. So in that sense, we should be attracting the best talent. And I think that was also your point, uh, Dr. Disiva, on, on, on attracting the best talent. And I think at certain times, CPC did not even have a chief financial officer, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because you, at those salaries, you just can't attract that kind of person. So um, I, I think as much as we talk about high salaries, I don't think in, in the government you can pay that kind of salary. So my next point is really, then why don't we privatize? And exactly what you said. I mean, why don't we just privatize everything? And if, if there is a need for some kind of, you know, energy security, and that might be a concern, uh, just like in many con other countries, you can always have some kind of strategic reserve uh, to to take you, you know, through certain, if, if there are, uh, you know, like COVID or if you can't transport uh, fuel, have a strategic reserve, but just open the rest of it. Because I'm sure doing that, you'll be able to bring down the cost of transport services or whatever it is. You're actually, your cost would even reduce further. Uh, so I, I think, I think we need to be bold in this situation. Uh, and, 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 you know, look, as, as somebody said, look at other models of other countries and, and how they have actually managed to uh, do the, you know, transform this sector, uh, privatize it, and actually still benefit and, and benefit the consumer as a result. No, I, I do agree that uh, uh, the right personnel should be paid the right salaries. Uh, that's one of the things that I did mention uh, getting in a professional as a managing director, uh, I don't think anyone with qualifications uh, in the petroleum industry uh, would be attractive to a, a salary what we offer at CPC. Uh, chairperson is the same position. Uh, but the, the problem that we do have is that uh, the other levels of employees that we do have at CPC are paid the same salary levels. Uh, so... Uh, a person from a driving job to a security job, uh, most of those are paid in the same scales as maybe a uh, financial officer. Uh, so that's the problem that we need to rectify. And, and also, uh, I, I, one of the other areas is that the procurement process. Uh, government procurement doesn't necessarily allow uh, CPC to proc purchase uh, from better suppliers uh, for better pricing. Uh, there are procedures that need to be followed, but there are certain companies and uh, countries that do not attract into these sort of procurement processes. So that has to be also amended in with, a, with, a, with some regulations. So those things have to be changed. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, can I come to you, Asanta? Yeah. Uh, Minister, two questions. One is, could you give us an idea about your plans to liberalize the jet fuel uh, sector? And uh, if you could give us a little history of how the CPC came to accumulate so much debt and how the uh, why you have a uh, unhedged uh, position on uh, dollar borrowings, which are not for investment, but for uh, goods which have already been sold and how the banks came to actually give such uh, big loans uh, for you who actually was the board approval, did the treasury approve it, did the central bank approve it, these large things, they seem to have been cyclically going on for many years. So how, how did that actually happen and who gave the orders to CPC to do this? Um. Starting with jet fuel, what we are looking right now is to see that uh, if there are suppliers that who could import fuel with their own funds, um, so that uh, they can use the CPSTL and CPC pipelines, uh, services at a service fee, and then supply to the airlines that are uh, needed. I, and I think that will create a, a healthy competition as well. But we do need to take into consideration. If the refinery is fully operational, we do have an opportunity of providing uh, jet fuel, about 70% of the requirement uh, currently. Uh, and that is one area that CPC can generate a lot of revenue as well. 
the second series of questions. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of question marks on approvals, who authorized those things. Uh, it, there is an investigation going on as well. That's why I did get the assistance of the police department to do investigation. I'm also going for a, a forensic audit to get some of the uh, uh, answers that we do have questions for. And, uh, and in terms of credit, that's how CPC has operated for the longest time. Um, tender procedure is how CPC has operated in procuring supplies. Uh, the tender procedures do uh, require uh, certain days of credit, 130 to 180 days of credit. Uh, but unfortunately, some of the advice that was given uh, by the Ministry of Finance was not followed up by the CPC as well. To convert some of the rupees into dollars at that time, uh, some of the guidelines that were given by the Ministry was not followed as well. So there are a lot of question marks, a lot of gray areas, um, and um, those are things that we are looking for answers as well. I mean, and then what happens is that becomes cost-reflective cost pricing, and then that gets dumped on the, the consumer. Now, that's really unfair. And, you know, Asanta has been writing about this for, I think, for a long time. You know, how did these things happen? I mean, why, when the petroleum corporation had money uh, to purchase dollars, why was it not allowed to do so? And got the banks to make it into long-term loans to the, the, the CPC. And now I think some $3 billion or something is, is uh, uh, due to the two banks. If I don't know, perhaps this data is also one of the... <laughs> <laughs> the ones that is not correct, I don't know. But procurement is an issue. Pro I mean, even today, today IMF says, you know, uh, these things will have to be looked at, corruption, vulnerabilities. So uh, I'm really glad that the minister is, you know, asking for forensic audits and, you know, getting the police involved in checking these things. Uh, because multiple allegations, if you look at social media, every day you see these things. And, um, you know, now these two huge purchases, one on, on various types of fuel and the other one on, on coal, which is a $1.5 billion procurement, Sri Lanka's largest, apparently, the procurement. So, the... the you know, somebody was asking me this in parliament um, about investigations and so on. I said, why don't you bring back the 19th Amendment? And if you bring back the 19th Amendment, uh, the independent, uh, uh, what do you call the uh, procurement, not the procurement, the, yeah, independent uh, procurement commission uh, was in the 19th Amendment, which was taken away uh, with the 20th, amendment to the constitution. So these are governance uh, things that go beyond a particular minister or a particular industry. And I think as a nation, we have to become more uh, transparent um, and accountable to the people because at the end of the day, we are saying cost reflective. And what does that cost include? If the cost includes corruption costs, if the cost includes wastage costs, if the cost includes, you know, um, other things that, is, that are unfair, to be a, 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 a burden on the consumer, then we have a problem. And you can't sell that, can't you? Know? Uh, however much you have my support, uh, or the opposition and the government here are both uh, on the same page, which is really very um, unusual. Uh, even if we support, how do we sell this to the public? Right? So, so those are critical issues. Uh, that we need to address because we have to get the people on our side. And people need to buy this idea as something that is going to be uh, actually going to lower their uh, daily uh, burden. I think one one of the things that uh, I, 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 even with the 19th Amendment, if the system is the same system, if CPC is still... Uh, the same way that he is operating right now, I don't think uh, the procurement process will change. 
um, when when you are working in a private sector, you will look at the best possible option, the how you're going to procure your supplies. Uh, you'll have to be competing with others in the market. Uh, that's what we should be reforming towards. And and also um, on on some of the losses that we do need to recover. Of course, Sri Lankan Airlines is a uh, one of the uh, I think about three hundred and fifty million dollars, which is owed to um, CPC for um, more than two decades. But do, I do have to uh, mention that the last three years, uh, the whatever procurement we have, uh, Sri Lankan Airlines has done with CPC has not been on credit terms. It has always been uh, the new chairman has uh, purchased jet fuel on cash basis. Uh, so there was no debt debt that was accumulated uh, in the last three years from Sri Lankan Airlines, but that, that was there for a long-standing period. Uh, and also CEB, uh, before the tariff revisions, um, CEB uh, ability to pay back uh, CPC was one of the biggest burdens that we did have. And uh, uh, the same way the private power purchasing companies, uh, we do distribute to them as well, but uh, unability of CEB to pay the private power companies uh, makes it difficult for us to recover money from them. So I, I hope with the new tariff revisions, with the electricity uh, tariffs that have come into place, maybe the next, next couple of months, it should be better for CEPC to recover some of those uh, debt from them. Uh, Damita, you had uh, a question or comment uh, over here. A little comment, the issues that we have discussed uh, throughout, I think is an inherent, are uh, inherent issues of the legislative framework that PPC, CB and other institutions operate. However much we think that there will be different kind of people managing it and uh, doing it in a different way, it won't happen because of this framework under which they are operating. So first thing is, as Minister said, we have to change the framework, legislative framework, uh, to expect different results. As long as this legislative framework is there, we will have the same result. 60 oh. years on, the same result, it will continue forward. What it's exactly do you mean changes to the legislative framework? Is that uh, regulation, the uh, 19th mm -hmm. Amendment? What? No, no, no. The CPC Act, PB Act, and the regulatory uh, uh, mechanisms, all those things, the legislative framework. The, the sector specific regulation and the general re, uh, regulation and the legislative framework should be looked into. But With the existing system, we will have yeah, the same result. Yeah, but on procurement, how? Why, what? What I'm saying I is. Mean, in procurement, we should have a legislative framework that helps you to purchase some good at the lowest possible. Uh, cost to the people uh, if given everything else remains the same yeah, I think Harsha, actually, now, now uh, one of some of the limitations that we do have in the last six months uh, is the amount of money that we do owe to the suppliers our long-standing suppliers are still owed about 800 million dollars from cpc so when long-standing suppliers are not able to supply since they haven't been paid and they can't offer any credit period uh, new suppliers that are coming in do not want to provide any credit facilities uh, and they do want to secure their payments. So they, there are advanced payments, prepayments, high premiums because of the risk that they're taking in providing to CPC right now. So those are some of the limitations that we do have at CPC uh, if you compare with LIOC. And what we did enjoy maybe eight months ago, we do not have that facility anymore. And without bank guarantees, without the ability to confirmation of a LC opened up at a uh, local state bank or even any private bank. Uh, so those are risks that the suppliers are taking. So that limits the ability of CPC to go into different markets to uh, get the best suppliers. Uh, so those are some of the limitations that I've seen in the last few months. Of course, there are so many suppliers who had offered credit facilities offered better premiums, uh, but uh, with the ability to pay back, that's what we have consulted with the Central Bank and the Ministry of Treasury, uh, Minister of Finance as well. 
for certain tenders that we do need to go in for credit facilities and maybe other payment methods. Now, uh, I'll check one example. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about crude oil, uh, how we do procure crude oil. One of one cargo of crude oil uh, cost uh, average about 80 million to 100 million dollars, one cargo of crude oil. But with the situation that we've been in the last four months, there's there was no ability for any of the banks or the central bank to provide funds to pay a direct cargo for 80 to 100 million dollars at once. So we had to speak with some of the suppliers to see whether we could pay in rupees. Deposit money weekly, uh, top up the accounts, go into NRRA account, escrow accounts, tri-party agreements. We worked out different angles to see whether we could procure these things. So when you're working uh, with the finance ministry, central bank, availability of funds, and the situation with CPC, and the inability of the local state banks and the other private banks to contribute towards this, there are limitations that we've had to work with. And that's why we're seeing some of the premiums are higher than usual, because if we do place orders maybe three months in advance or two months in advance, or at least a month in advance, with some sort of advance payment, we can get some of these uh, premiums at much lesser prices than what we are getting right now. But with the limitations that we do have, one uh, example is now, uh, day before yesterday, we paid 40 million, uh, 41 million for a petrol uh, cargo that was at our harbor uh, on an essential basis. But we did have other commitments of about $80 million for advance payments for the next few shipments. So when we do delay by a day or two to make those payments, premiums go up. The chance of losing that cargo is much higher. So it's a very difficult scenario right now. It's something that we have to think out of the box to get the supplies in. Uh, we've actually spoken with LIOC because LIOC has a 40 million budget for a month. Uh, but whereas CPC has a budget of about 600 million. And even after we do all the procurement, we do have to make payments for the next month in advance as well. But we do recover money. Maybe uh, recovery is about 3 billion rupees a month. Uh, so our situation was that uh, limitation in Forex and limitation in rupees as well. So both limitations were there in uh, some of these procurement work. Okay. I was just going to say, be careful about getting into relationships on the rebound. <laughs> uh, all right. We will make that the last question. Uh, and that's... that's the Thank you. Uh, I'm Janitrika. I represent Transparency International Sri Lanka. So my question actually connects to a couple of uh, points made by the audience as well as Dr. Harshan, Honorable Minister. So my question is simple. Um, so we talked about procurement. Uh, I just want to ask whether, uh, Honorable Minister, you have a plan uh, uh, to make the procurement process more transparent for CPC or maybe for the ministry? Because for two reasons, as actually, uh, one is that uh, procurement is an area where a lot of uh, conflict of interest and bribery and collusion, a lot of things happen. And most importantly, because of the lack of information, there's a huge gap in the pub in public trust about public institutions, especially like CPC. So maybe making information uh, practically uh, dis uh, you know available to the public, maybe that will help to you know reduce the gap. So I just want to check if you have check or see if you have any plan on that angle as well. Thank you. Uh, one thing we have to understand about CPC procurement is now everyone thinks that the minister has uh, direct uh, control over how the procurement works. Not even the chairman of CPC has direct control of it. Uh, how procurement works CPC is that you call for tenders for certain products. There are term tenders, there are long-term tenders. We do have to wait until the tender procedure is over to uh, maybe evaluate the other proposals that we have the alternatives that we have. Uh, that's what we did in the past, that we did uh, call for tenders, so the lowest bidder could could uh, uh, bid on the tenders. But uh, last three months, since I've been in the job for about five months, 
um, last three months, 95% uh, of our tenders, uh, there were no suppliers bidding on them. So there was absolutely no one bidding on any of the tenders. There are about 55 registered suppliers who had been supplying. Uh, but we did receive about 230 uh, or maybe about 250 uh, unsolicited proposals, which was evaluated by CPC. So there is a commercial team that sits with CPSTL, CPC, does a stock review, does an assessment of what our requirements are, and then they evaluate uh, the tender procedure. And then if there is no one bidding on the tender, then they go for the uh, unsolicited proposals. So the unsolicited proposals are evaluated in a way with the consultation of the Treasury and uh, the central bank uh, to see how we can pay them back as well. So that is one of the concerns that we had. Uh, there is a technical evaluation committee who gives a approval uh, if those products are in line. Then there's a another uh, final uh, approval committee, a cabinet appointed procurement committee, uh, which is been chaired by uh, one of the ministry secretaries from not from the Ministry of Power and Energy. Right now, it's the Ministry of Ports and Shipping. Uh, then there is the secretary for the Ministry of Power and Energy. Uh, a board, a member from the Treasury, a member from uh, BOC, a member from uh, the Central Bank, uh, and two members from CPC, the MD, and the commercial DGM. So the seven members actually gives the clearance uh, for those things. So if they do find uh, certain unsolicited proposals not in line with the pricing, that's when we do have to go to the cabinet to get a cabinet consent. So we did have to go three or four times to the cabinet because there was no other options, there was no other suppliers, there was no other proposals that did uh, fulfill the requirements that we did have. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, at high premium prices than what we are used to paying, uh, but all those information is available. That's why I wanted to get the investigative of officials to give an accurate uh, idea to the public and I did request Dr. Harsha to uh, to investigate any sort of procurement work, any of these uh, uh, suppliers um, through the finance committee as well so that there will be better understanding on how we can do. Even if I'm the minister and if I want something pushed, it cannot be done in this system. It's a system where the officials, the commercial department, the marketing department, CPSTL, the technical guys, the refinery, uh, officials from various other institutions take so many hours in deciding and giving a, a clear approval on that. We'll ask everybody to go for their final thoughts also, so you can start uh, Dr. Tisma with that. Okay, right. Thanks. Um, you know, can I add one more thing? Now, there's a lot of discussion about why Russia is not approached for uh, cheaper fuel. Uh, we did speak with the, the Russian embassy as soon as I took office. Um, and the ambassador shared a few company details. But when we did reach out to them, the feedback from the companies and feedback from the embassy was that none of the Russian companies would be taking part in the tender process. Tender process is not something that we do take part in. If we do need to take fuel from them, we ap approach them directly. That is something that's limited. We cannot do with CPC. We have to go by the tender process. If we do not get any people bidding on the tender, that's when we do go for the uh, unsolicited proposals. But the Russian suppliers don't come with unsolicited proposals as well. It's long-term contracts uh, that doesn't CPC is not allowed by the government procurement system to get into. We'll start. Maybe Harsha can change that and give, uh, <laughs> the finance committee can give some recommendations for the procurement process. Yeah, I mean, Kanchana challenged and I took it up. So we will, uh, through the Committee on Public Finance, go into this because our committee is a, is a you know, it's a live one. I mean, it's not a post-mortem like Co COPE and COPA. You know, the, the, under the, uh, you know, Article 148 of the Constitution, uh, full control of finance uh, is supposedly with the legislature. Uh, so therefore, we are going to use that 
Um, and we are going to think about and come up with a way in which we are first going to look at this whole coal thing and then about procurement and others because our committee has the power to look at every cent spent by uh, through the consolidated uh, fund. So any money that has been uh, used to procure anything uh, can be uh, can be uh, questioned and investigated, and uh, if there is something wrong, then we will uh, think about what to do next. But I'm going to do that uh, as the chair of uh, the committee on public finance. I have the authority to do that, and I will do that. Um, and we will then try to. Uh, I mean, I feel in a way I I feel sorry for Kanchan also because he he's under a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, people are killing each other at the fuel stations. He has to get some fuel to the people, uh, but he cannot go outside the system. Um, so you put yourself in his shoes, you empathize with him. You see his frustration, and that's really why I am actually, I applaud him for the good work he's doing. I think this is the kind of uh, new blood that we need. I'm, I'm not trying to get a ministry or anything like that by praising him. That's no, it would be easy. I'm not going. <laughs> but but so 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 there are two sides to this. Um, and what I want to do is to be transparent. And um, you know, we probably would like Transparency International somehow uh, to be a part of this thing because this is going to be open to the public. And, and we will open uh, the Committee on Public Finance to the media, uh, like COPE and COPE have already done. And then people will be able to, to, to participate in this. Uh, the ex we need not hide anything from anybody. The public money that the, you are spending at uh, Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, it's not your money. So we have the right, public has the right to know how the public money is spent. And there is no one who can say no, because the the, the legislature has the power uh, to take that information out and share it with the public. So you will see a lot of changes uh, in all these areas uh, using the platform that we have now got uh, with the Committee on Public Finance. Uh, final comments, Mr. Prince. I think it's a, a great platform, and just to get uh, ideas of uh, uh, of the uh, the participants here and uh, of course I will take all the positive when uh, the proposals made here some of the adjustments that we do we can make in the reforms that all will be considered uh, not just the petroleum corporation I think um, all these uh, public institutes needs reforms so that's where we need to get together uh, but I do believe that we have a um, we we do have to work uh, very quickly. There's a short maybe a window for us to get these reforms uh, in. Uh, I, I delaying things we've seen in the past uh, that uh, these reforms uh, were not being able to implement. So I um, do value uh, the input from Harsha and all the participants here. And uh, I hope that Harsha can ease some of the burden that I do have, not as the chairman of the Committee of Finance, but uh, taking over the finance ministry would help me a lot more and be more transparent to the public as well. So I hope he takes this challenge, the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, and we do have extended uh, invitation even with the restructuring plans of CEB. The official invitation will go out to the main opposition uh, next week, we're hoping to meet everyone uh, to see uh, what sort of concerns that we have so that it could be something that is agreed by all parties in the parliament. Um, so that's what we're hoping to do. Um, I know that CPC uh, has so many limitations working in this environment um, and, uh, and not just uh, uh, the workforce, everyone who's involved in it, stakeholders. I've had day-to-day -day meetings with central bank finance ministry i think probably more meetings were done with the cpc staff uh, so we are hoping uh, with the imf support coming in other development agencies coming in right restructuring restructuring work that is 
been proposed uh, that six months from now we would see much better uh, situation in terms of the petroleum products going into the customers, the distribution, the supply, and the revenue as well. Thank you very much. Andres, any closing thoughts? Yeah, uh, from my side also, I must say I, I find it a very open, constructive discussion. Um, also, uh, I'm really impressed by the speed um, how decisions are taken now and how the emergency situation uh, in, in uh, CPC in the petroleum and energy sector are uh, addressed. Um, um, from my side, all only one point that I would like to mention again is that um, I think it's very important to send out a message also to foreign uh, direct investors and potential partners that it is a long-term policy, uh, that's sustainable policy. Um, it's good to take this decision, but as Dr. Hasha de Silva said, we have to think really of the, about the future and uh, with a long-term perspective. And uh, therefore, it would be really very important to set up also the legal frame, which will guarantee that uh, engagement uh, by the uh, Sri Lankan government. All right. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll give them a warm round of applause. They've been uh, remarkably candid and uh, open. Uh, and, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, on behalf of uh, FNF Sri Lanka, uh, I hope you will stick around, uh, ha have some conversation. There is some food. Uh, please enjoy the evening and uh, thank you very much.